Hello, Tom Allen here. I'm a comedian and I've written a book, so I guess I'm an author as well. And I'm with Ben Murphy. Who's Ben Murphy? Ben Murphy? Oh, that was... Welcome to another episode of my show, Ben Murphy is Getting to Know, where every week I take a bit of time to get to know a cause, a tourist attraction, an artist, a celebrity, and more. I genuinely love getting to know more about things and people that interest me, even more so when it's something or someone I'm a genuine fan of. Today is one of those extra special days where my job crosses over to getting to talk with someone whose work I admire and that made me laugh and smile so much throughout the many lockdowns and sadness that came with it all. From winning the Newcomer Award on So You Think You're Funny to supporting Sarah Millican on a sold out tour of Australia, New Zealand and the UK to then selling out his own show Indeed at the Edinburgh Festival to now becoming a staple on British TV on 8 out of 10 Cuts Does Countdown, Mock the Week, Big Brother's Big Mouth, to being the host on Bake Off The Professionals and The Apprentice You're Fired. And then to now adding acclaimed author with his hilarious new book, No Shame, to his impressive list of achievements. Please welcome live, all the way from London, Tom Allen. Oh, well, what a lovely introduction. And thank you. Hello from oh. London. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the I'm, European I'm really good. I'm going to give you a big, big thank you because during the many lockdowns here in Australia, I've found myself delving deep into the black hole of Tom Allen on, on YouTube. Not uh, nothing inappropriate. <laughs> sure. Well, well, they're probably all available. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> You're checking out everything, like from mock the week clips to eight out of ten cats does countdown, or my personal favourite roast battle. Your videos have almost been on constant loop in my household. Oh my goodness, that's lovely of you to say. I forget that we live in an age when things live like that online. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So kind of things can be revisited. I kind of go, oh, that's that was that. I've done that. And I hope people have laughed. And then you forget that actually we live in an age of perpetuity, that um, things, yeah, things keep existing. But I'm thrilled that they've they brought you some happiness. I'm delighted. <laughs> I guess that must be a weird feeling where you reach that certain level of fame where you find out that fans and that know more about what you've done and remember things better than you yourself have done. Oh, well, well, I mean, I'm very flattered. I'm very flattered if anybody has. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I kind of... Um, no, I'm, I've always been very grateful to be busy. I've, I've been a stand-up now for about, it was about 16 years since I did my first gig. And did um, you were five, that's incredible. Me. So yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So it took me about 13, 14 years to st sort of get booked on television things and, 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 and writing a book was something I'd always wanted to do. So I do feel very lucky. Um, and I, I do, I'm, I try and be very, you know, hashtag grateful as we should be. Um, uh, because... I, you, you know, it, I, I do, it did take me a long time and I thought, well, maybe this won't work out and maybe I made a terrible mistake. So I'm very, I'm very grateful to be on things and, and very grateful if anybody does watch my stuff. I feel like I exist in a space between um, people very kind of like yourself watching my stuff and then other people like the other day when I was out with my mum and dad, a woman of, of, of my mum and dad's sort of age came up and was like, um, now I know you from somewhere. We know you, but we don't know where. Are you famous? And I said, well, if you have to ask, then probably not. No. Um, but I, felt I didn't like to be too, I didn't like to be too, you know, mean to her because obviously she's a sweet older lady. But at the same time, I was a bit pissed off. Oh, well, <laughs> rightfully so. <laughs> well, I think uh, if anything, you've probably caused a bit of uh, pissing off my friends because I've gone into this habit of all your clips and uh, cutting out little bits and sending them to my friends and posting it on Facebook. It's, it's such fun. And I always... <laughs> I've always wanted to be one, be one of those people that people clipped up. Yeah, you might end up a, an actual um, meme one of these days soon. <laughs> my, my dream is to be a meme. A dream of being a meme. <laughs> well, I always really enjoy your humour and I also really enjoy getting to see what dapper outfit you're going to have on TV. And I was a little bit worried getting to chat to you via Zoom that I'd see you in a tracksuit and sweats. And I'm, I'm, oh. I'm so glad you didn't disappoint. Yeah. I... Um, yeah, no, I, even on, in the age of Zoom calls, 
um, I find myself still uh, slightly dressing up. Uh, I mean, one just because people seem to be a little bit irked if I don't wear something smart, but also it kind of focuses me a bit to go, oh, yes, this is a work occasion. Because I think if I was just wearing maybe my fleecy pajamas, um, uh, then I, I think people, I think it would probably encourage me to be a bit slovenly. Do you do the cheeky RuPaul thing where you're like business at the top but out of the camera frame? You've got the uh, the real Tom Allen <laughs> rocking it down below. Um, no, I've I've got very I don't think I've got very I've got my linen slacks on today. So oh, I don't nice. Know. <laughs> yeah, I've got my I've just just sort of just, just let your listener know that I am properly attired for this occasion. I hate to let <laughs> people down. <laughs> Now, um, I may be making assumptions, but I'm, I'm guessing if you're anything like me, sports isn't really one of your things. You have said that you see a personal trainer three times a week. He makes you put on gloves, you say witty things, and then he punches you. Is that kind of the extent of your workout routine? <laughs> Did I say that? Um, I must stop doing those interviews. <laughs> I, um, the, <laughs> the, um, I, well, I, have, I do do boxing sessions two to three times a week, and I, I punch his hands. He doesn't punch me. I think that's a different sort of um, occasion uh, when someone comes around and punches you. Um, but um, I enjoy that very much. And actually, to be fair, I have got a bit more into football or uh, uh, soccer. I don't know. What, what, would you, what do you call? I, we, we, know what you mean. we know what you mean. <laughs> you call, what you call Aussie rules? Football, yeah, so um, your soccer is um, so your football is soccer here. Everything else is football. <laughs> I see. But America, what do you call American football? Awful. American football. <laughs> Awful. Yeah. yeah. Why are they all <laughs> wearing those shoulder pads? It's not the eighties. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> Get a perm. They as look well. like receptionists. Yeah. What have they got under those helmets? Perms. <laughs> um, the um, but anyway, the uh, thank you. Well, I got a little bit more into soccer because a friend of mine took me to a soccer game. Um, uh, because he's a reporter for Sky Sports, which is the big sports channel here. And I was like, who watches this show? No one's going to watch it. Anyway, it's one of those things that like literally 7 million people watch every Saturday. And I was just messing around, sort of describing the game as I saw it, which is essentially a bloke ran over there and then a, he ran over there and then he fell over and everybody booed. And I jumped up and down when they scored a goal. And then I looked, just casually looked at my phone and then realised that I was all, like on Twitter, very popular. A lot of people very happy that I was there and offering a, a different type of um, different, a different type of commentary. Some soccer fans very angry, but um, it did kind of galvanise my feeling that actually things like football, soccer, whatever, actually are open to everybody, and it's okay. You can respond to a goal however you like. And and when I realised that, then I actually got quite into it. And so today, when I'm speaking to you. Um, England are doing well in the in the Euros, and we're through to the final on Sunday. So, um, so I'm very excited about that, um, and and I, I might be going. So I'm very Ooh. I'm very excited. That seems yeah, so I've sort of got something got into it. No, sorry, yeah. I was going to say you. It sounds like you're getting right into attending a lot of sports. So you're possibly going to that soccer game coming up, a old football game. But you also went to Wimbledon for the first time. Yes, I did. And in fact, I was wearing this blazer, but I do have other clothes, Ben. I don't want you to think. Are you, are you sure it's just one. the same one, reversible? So, yeah, just style it so dramatically differently. Um, I did, and I loved it. Uh, I didn't know anything about tennis, really, um, but it was lovely. I mean, it's very civilised as well, tennis. It's quite, I mean, it's different. It's a different sort of vibe to something like football where people jump up and down and scream, which is also enjoyable. But tennis is very like sit down, watch a bit, have some lunch, watch a bit more, have maybe an afternoon tea, um, have a pims, um, <laughs> and and it sort of it feels very it feels very very sort of decadent really, and lots of strawberries is is the tradition in England because that's when they're in season. Um, I'm talking a lot about the food here rather than the actual sport, aren't I? But I like it's a nice day out, and and actually I saw Roger Federer play, and. He, he was phenomenal, you know, incredible person. And I was making witty comments like that ball was more out than I am. People, <laughs> people around me thought I was very funny until the usher told me to shut up. But uh, did was, you it, genuinely it, get told to shush my ashes? <laughs> he, well, there were lots of people talking, like muttering, like between the, between the balls, as it were. <laughs> and, um, and then I, he, he turned around to lots of people, but at one point he did turn around to me and say, shush, please, tennis, which doesn't really make any sense. 
as a sentence. But, I mean, I just... um, shush, please, Dennis. Shush, please, Dennis. You've got to hear those beautiful sounds know, of sorry. the balls whacking or something, I guess. <laughs> I get, well, I wasn't talking while they were playing, I hasten to add. It was just between, which I always think is a great moment. And obviously you attending um, something like Wimbledon is a great chance to dress up because in your book, No Shame, you talk about dressing up in Victorian clothing, believing that dressing that way and wishing hard enough, you could be someone else living in a different world. Uh, this seems to be a feeling that a lot of young queer people have, albeit back in our teenage years, uh, we're both the same age of 37. Most teenage boys going through what we were going through were dressing up as goths or dyeing their hair pink. You decided to go the... Uh, <laughs> Victorian route. <laughs> what was that all I about? I, I think I thought it was the most subversive I could be. I thought, well, if I become a goth, there's loads of other goths. Or if I become, you know, just like a petulant teenager who doesn't want to, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to concentrate at school, then that's what all the other teenagers are doing. So I think I thought I was being very subversive in my way by, by actually being all the more formal. And I wonder, I think it's twofold. I think it was a way of kind of showing that I was different. Yeah. And I think as well, I think I wanted to emulate in my mind a world which did seem more formal and more rules based because I think uh, looking back, the world felt very frightening to me as a young queer person surrounded seemingly by so many straight people and, and such a sort of heteronormative dominance. I can use those terms. What big words? I don't even know. I know. If it's, I'm using them correctly. But I can't say I that like... because of my peach impediment. A speech impediment. <laughs> Never mind. Well, well, I don't even know if the correct words. Um, the, well, he, he, I don't even know if I'm using these words correctly, but, but I, you know, kind of a world which, which felt very intimidating. And I think I, I very kind of, and I suppose my feelings I was very afraid of, this idea of being suddenly uh, like realising I was fancying the other guys and, um, and, and all of that and, and realising that they, they weren't going to be accepting of that and nobody in the world around me seemed to be accepting of that and I think so I craved a world where there were like structure and rules and etiquette I was obsessed with etiquette manuals and laying the table and um and and things like fish knives. I went and spent my birthday money on fish knives at one <laughs> oh, wow. point. um and I know probably in Australia everybody thinks everybody in England uh behaves like this in truth we don't we have I, I mean if you don't if, if, if people aren't haven't seen us we are just a ba basically a, a bunch of drunk louts um, and um, and and uh, and yet we send out programs like Downton Abbey to try and convince people otherwise. But, <laughs> but, so it, it was kind of very unusual to be obsessed with kind of napkin folding when I was fifteen. But that was I was like, no, this is my world. This is the sort of world I created in my mind, which, as I say, I think felt a bit safer to me. And I don't, I don't, I, I was sort of nervous when I wrote the book. I thought, well, will other people kind of know what I'm going on about, or will they be like, what are you talking about, you weirdo? But actually. You, you know, quite pleasingly, I realised through writing the book, lots of people have felt like that and have done strange things as a result of feeling outside or different. And um, that was very heartening because I suppose fundamentally, uh, the queer experience um, is, is actually is, 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 is repeated everywhere because at some point, everybody will feel like an outsider. And everybody, I think as human beings, we carry that sense of, um, of, of sort of, I don't know, sort of solitariness and, and kind of outsiders. But it, 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 yeah, it, it, was, it was nice. It was, and it was really great to know that I wasn't the only queer person who'd had those experiences of, of, of feeling one way, but doing something, doing, doing something kind of counterintuitive or counterproductive um, as a result. And I, I always say, but human beings are complicated, aren't they? And, and if human beings <laughs> made sense, then, you know, neither of us would have a job because you know, there'd be nothing to talk about. I did thoroughly enjoy that chapter in the book and talking about it. And it, it did sort of reflect on my childhood and growing up. I didn't go Victorian clothing uh, and that wasn't my world of um, imagination. Mine became uh, like Jim Carrey's The Riddler. I imagined myself as this evil villain. I even set up an, a lair in my bedroom and I had this embroidered dragon silk dressing gown that I wore. And I think in my <laughs> mind, if I was this super villain, no one could hurt me if I was the, That's the one. That's so interesting you say that, Ben, because I, I met a, uh, an intellect, and an, what are they called? Uh, yeah, intellectual, somebody who works, what are they called? They work in universities, an academic. Um, <laughs> and he, you know, <laughs> I didn't go to university. Words. So that, <laughs> yeah. Um, and we were talking about that. And I think a lot of queer people like the villains more than they like the goodies. And I, again, I thought this was just like another compounding factor in my, my outsiderness. But I always liked, like, I always wanted to be Emperor Ming in Flash Gordon, or I wanted to be, 
you, you know, like anything about kind of, you know, Dracula or any, any kind of, I don't know, anybody who was the baddie I always sided with. And as I, he explained a lot of, a lot of people feel like that because, and if you look at a lot of Disney, they kind of have kind of, the baddies often have a kind of quite camp sensibility. If you think yeah. of like Ursula or Scar, they kind of, they have much more, they always have the best lines, they have the best outfits, they have the best voices, the most fun songs. Like there's, there's something about them that's much more, appeal- well, it certainly felt much more appealing to me than like, you know, the goodies who are always so boring. Well, the, the goodies are usually too, are usually quite the antithesis of what we as queer people face. They're usually really jocular. They're very popular. They're very strong. They're yes. everything that we're not and they're everything that puts us down. So maybe that's why we relate more to the others. I think so. You know, it's been very interesting. I'm, I've always been interested as well in the sort of um, sort of quiet, I can, the quiet realizations I had of feeling different before I was, you know, as a queer person, obviously it's often rooted in who you fancy or who you fall in love with. Um, but at the same time, for me, um, it, it was, it was before, it was long before I fancied anybody. I was interested in capes and I was interested in top hats and I was interested in, um, you know, watching Patricia Routledge or Victoria Wood on the television or, you, you know, kind of strange kind of messaging really that I was, um, <laughs> sending out really to the wider world of like I am different or you know kind of enjoying the music of Elton John when I was like nine you know much more like not as in like oh I quite like Elton John I was like obsessed with Elton John <laughs> loved him and in a, in a time when he wasn't particularly prolific either but I, I was drawn to him and I, I think there are those kind of things that we have and we do that are part of the the magic of being different I suppose and I kind of love to embrace it really that we are often often more um creative and much more, have a much more interesting view of the world i'm going to shift gears slightly now uh, both you and i were born in the year 1983 uh, one of us is independent self-motivated and hates people doing things for them uh, the other still lives at home with their parents <laughs> so, um... <laughs> well ben i hate to break it to you but a couple of weeks ago i did actually move out oh, so i'm here in my own home so, um, yeah, sorry to disappoint you, but I, if you can, <laughs> you can hear an echo, it's not because I live in a church, uh, it's because I don't have any furniture. So the house is very echoey um, and I keep forgetting. Getting furniture is really difficult and takes ages to arrive. And, um, and of course, you know, aesthetically, I'm very particular. So <laughs> I, I can't just have any old couch or or chair so i'm waiting for the perfect table uh so yeah so if it sounds very echoey that's why it's not because i'm in some sort of i'm not i'm not in a mortuary or something or a, or a... was the move out a result of um being locked at home during lockdown with your parents and it just got too much or you think it was just time to <laughs> well i think i think you know 37 late 30s this is a good time uh, i think um i love spending time with late my 20s I, we'll, we'll both pretend <laughs> yeah, yeah we look great actually ben um but but i i i like spending time with my mum and dad and i think when i was in a lot of the time i was on tour as a comic and or i was out doing stuff and actually i liked having the the, the sort of base of having my family there to yeah. to to catch up with when i was back home um but uh, yeah, I knew I had to get my own place at some point. But it's very stressful having your own place. You have to worry about it. It's like guttering, guttering, and you know when to take out the recycling, and and then taking the recycling back in when they've collected it, <laughs> and, and all those things. It's very tiring, and especially I guess in this industry too, where you go from you know you're on TV, you're doing things, you're getting recognised, and it's good to then go home and have you know your parents and family, and loved ones, just to bring you down and make you feel a little bit normal as well. Oh yeah, like absolutely. Like I'm in my late thirties now, and you know I've, I've done quite well. But like my mum and dad, like my dad won't let me go out on a bike. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, oh, cute. don't no, please don't go out. Let me give you a lift up the road. No, don't get. Let, put the bike in the back, and then I'll just drop you. And then I'm, you know, I'm nearly forty. Like most people have families and stuff, but I'm no, don't no, don't you regret it? No, don't think you should do that. So I live in this kind of world of still kind of slightly being dominated by them. And I've ended up buying around the corner from them, um, oh, wow. which, I suppose is, which was foolish of me, really, because they sort of love to pop round, which is a little bit um, much. But it's, Dad likes to mow the, I've got a lawn in the back, so he likes to cut the grass. I'll do that for No, let me do that for you. Um, I think they think I'm an imbecile. They think I can't do these <laughs> things. I can do them. 
Yeah, I also noticed that we've got uh, both had similar thoughts with our high school swimming classes, trying to distract ourselves when it suddenly gets quite hot by the pool. <laughs> yes, I did find that was very stressful as a teenager. <laughs> and um, for perhaps obvious reasons. And um, I remember, yeah, so I remember having to, um, ha- having to kind of channel my energies into distraction. And that largely came in the form of, um, reciting my my what's my oh, i'm sorry my phone um that largely came in the form of um of reciting my scales for my piano lessons in my head um or sometimes out loud just sort of reciting like a g-sharp minor scale um and uh and and it was it, it was kind of it was good actually that year those, those years i got very good at playing the piano did very well <laughs> in my piano exam i'll say that it's so stressful anyway but like growing up and i think looking back you know growing up realizing you're gay oh, and, and then having to hide it it's so exhausting yeah. like my parents were like oh i'm worried about you i always you know you seem very sleepy and looking back i think i was just absolutely exhausted because i was like trying to do my schoolwork, trying to come to terms with the fact that i'm a human being who has feelings and is growing up and then having to deny all of it <laughs> so it was very <laughs> like toxic really it's just, it weighs you down i think so yeah and I do, I talk a bit about it in the book. We had a, a law in, in the UK in the 80s, which Margaret Thatcher's government brought in, which basically meant that uh, teachers weren't even allowed to, well, could, ne- could never teach that, that being gay was okay. They could never say that homosexuality was, was, a, was, 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 was an ex- something like an acceptable form of something. I can't remember. It was very toxic, again, toxic, but it meant that teachers were in this impossible position where they couldn't talk about being gay being okay and i had a wonderful teacher um who did talk about that talk about the rule Uh, because they could you know they'd risk losing their jobs and everything um so um she talked about it and i was like oh my goodness this really makes sense now but it was um it it was a it was it was a very pernicious thing and and i think a lot of people sort of our age in this country um I, i think have a repercussion from it because i think it it did sort of feel very kind of strange to have an a total absence of any positivity around around being a human being you know it was very kind of and i think it gives you um, like young queer people if you, you're not allowed to talk about things it makes you feel that something's wrong with you and you should be ashamed of yourself and yeah. i guess in your um current literary achievement no shame i really like how you put it in the book that most of the shame that people feel comes from things we can't control like our socioeconomic status our skin color our religion sexuality etc did uh, your interest in comedy and developing a strong wit come from, uh, like a lot of people, a way to deflect your shame and deal with it in your own way? So, what, sorry, what was that question? Sorry, Ben, what was the question again? Did, did um, with the shame and that as a young queer person and, and like a lot of other people that are, are quite different, did your interest in humour uh, develop from your shame in a way to deflect and protect yourself? Well, I mean, in, in, in the book, I really talk about it, shame from a either socioeconomic or, or sexuality perspective. Um, and, and, and those two things, because uh, I, I come from a very n- sort of quite ordinary working class background, really. My dad uh, was a coach driver and my mum worked in a department store. But, they, um, but, but, they, uh, but, but yeah, I think there was a sense that we always felt, I don't know, di- different in that respect. And I think there's a tradition of, of people who feel any kind of shame, shame, sometimes channeling it into, into the way they see the world, because you naturally stand on the outside anyway, or you feel like you're standing on the outside. So you have a good perspective to look in and make fun. And I think it's a way of coping with the world as well. Like it's, it sounds maybe a bit um, portentous of me to say that I think some people tell jokes to, to, to make people laugh, but some people tell jokes just to survive. And I think it is a way of kind of coping with the world and making the world more acceptable or, or taking the sting out of the, the, the world at times. If we laugh at it, it loses the, the, the cruelty of the world, loses its power. I, um, I sometimes find that like, what I enjoy doing is kind of making fun of people with, with some of the TV shows I do. And I like to kind of, I work with a spin off show from Bake Off called Extra Slice, and um, people bring in their cakes. And Bake Off, the Great British Bake Off has a, has this kind of vibe of being very positive and kind of calm. <laughs> but with that show, I kind of like to be quite mean. Because I think uh, what I like to think people seem to enjoy it, but I uh, what I find is is that 
by being openly, playfully mean about the cake they brought in, it sort of means that we laugh about that meanness yes. that exists on social media or exists behind, you know, closed doors or exists in the playground. If we bring out the meanness into the open and laugh about it, then it, it, it loses its, its, its control over us. It's, it, our, it takes away some of our, our fear of it. So that, that was, that's my ambition anyway. Maybe it's lofty of me to say, but that, that's, that's what I found seems to, seems to be the case. And I, I do think, you, you know, in a world which is very frightening uh, now, but it's, it's always been, I think, one way or another, um, we, it's, a, it's a human coping mechanism. Uh, it, totally. It's not lofty at all. And I think um, that's been demonstrated. Like um, people use like racial slurs and homophobic things. People, when they take it back themselves, it loses the power. And I think humor is the same thing. If people are putting things down and you take that on and use it and you own it, it can't be weaponized against you anymore, which is, which is wonderful. Yeah. It's very, it's a, it's a very clever way of doing it, a very sort of subversive thing, I think. And camp comedy, I think has done it for a long time in a very, interesting i always found it very interesting the way that it flips the world and i always think the definition of camp is that it takes the serious flippant it treats the serious flippantly and it takes that which is flippant and treats it very seriously so you know being obsessed with judy garland uh, is suddenly like the most serious thing in the world whereas you, you know being i don't know i don't know feeling being being bullied at school if you reflect on that in a way that is that takes that makes fun of it if you can then um then then, then i think that's a, a subversive act really and and and, and, a, and a really um powerful protest actually okay that's how we just heard means it's time to play this or that 60 seconds will go on the clock and i will ask you as many questions as i can each with two answers you must choose one of the answers hence this or that Tom Allen, acclaimed comedian, television host, fashionista, and author. Are you ready? I think, well, I think so. <laughs> okay. Your time starts now. Writing a book, soul destroying or therapeutic? Therapeutic. Well, uh, American comedians or Australian comedians? Oh, Australian comedians. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, hosting a TV show or hosting a live comedy night? Uh, I love them both. Um, well, what about hosting a live comedy night on television? <laughs> nice. Uh, did any of the roast battle jokes genuinely hurt? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Who is nicer, Jimmy Carr or James Corden? Oh, good, good choices. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, James Corden once came up to me in a restaurant and said he's pleased. He, 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 he was very complimentary of me. Uh, and um, I was very touched by that. So I, 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 J- Jimmy Carr, I've known for years, has never done that. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, off camera, who's the funniest? Susie Dent or Rachel Riley? S- Susie Dent, I think. She's so serious on the show. Would you ever want to have children? N- no. <laughs> <laughs> Does pineapple belong on pizza? Sure. Who's a bigger pain in the ass? Sean Locke or John Richardson? Sean Locke. No, John Richardson. <laughs> no, I don't know. They're both quite strict if you're on their team. Uh, can we expect to see you on tour in Australia again when it's safe to travel? I would love to if, 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 if you'll have me. And finally, should people get out and buy your brilliant new book, now available in paperback, No Shame? I, I like to think so, yes. I think... Um, it's a queer life in suburbia is its subheading, and um, and I think well, if ever you felt like a an outsider uh, or have even lived in suburbia, you might find something to enjoy in it. But I'm I'm very proud of it. I think there's something in that book for for everyone, especially um, Australians have very similar sort of lifestyles as you do in the UK. And uh, queer or not queer, there's something in that book for everyone. Uh, it's called No Shame. It's out now, and you can follow Tom on all the socials at Tom Indeed. That is at Tom Indeed. Tom Allen, thank you so very much for your time. Ben, this has been an absolute treat. Thank you for having me.